Good morning, good afternoon or good evening, depending on when you're watching this edition of Hypnosis Week. Uh, yes, it's me back yet again, Alex William Smith by birth, but better known to many of you as Jonathan Royal Hypnotist, the British bad boy of hypnosis of MagicalGuru.com. As always, that's enough about me. The whole point of this show is to bring you guests each week who cover a different area of the psychological talking mind therapies and related areas uh because there's all different names but ultimately that kind of gives a description of it the gentleman that we've got on the show this week i met physically just over a couple of years ago uh, although we'd met online virtually as it were prior to that and at the time um and as I always say, anything I say, I take full legal responsibility for on these interviews. Uh, the guests obviously have to decide what they choose to say or not say themselves, but I take full responsibility for anything I say. So, um, yeah, we met when uh, I noticed that he you know, he was on my friend list on, on Facebook, and I noticed that he um, was a trainer for a modality called All Pain to Go. Um, which had been set up by a guy called Stephen Blake. And I don't know why, but something in my head said, contact this guy. And that I'm talking about the guy I'm about to introduce you to. You see on screen, but in a moment he'll be talking. And I did. And I said, look, I'm, I'm quite intrigued. What the hell is this all pain to go? And ultimately, I did the All Pain to Go course with the gentleman I'm about to introduce and very rapidly discovered that, the, the well, that frankly, what All Pain to Go was uh, is a title and a brand. Um, and if you're wondering why I said title, uh, if you search Alan Partridge uh, on YouTube, Alan Partridge, Steve Coogan, amongst the episodes, going, it's just a title at this stage will become clear to you. Otherwise, it'll make no sense whatsoever. But it's just a title in so much as it turned out, it was something that I immediately knew had been published uh, in Richard Bandler's Frogs into Prince's book. Uh, it had been published in a Hypnosis Comprehensive Guide by Tad James uh, and numerous other books predating All Pain to Go as a Brand by decades the actual technique itself law just repackaged with a new name and that political things went on which do happen in this industry sadly and ultimately um i, I said to martin I, I, i've got my old pain to go certificate don't get me wrong i'm not saying the the, the the technique isn't good it is but it was good when it was released decades ago is the point and i said to martin you can't you, you this politics, it's all, it's just complete and utter nonsense because the guy I'm going to introduce you to is very honest and he was being honest when asked certain things. And in the end, uh, I said, what, what, and other people did, why don't you start teaching this yourself? Because people are always already happy with how you're teaching, but why don't you rebrand it? And that was the embryo of something that then turned into... So why not, you know, why not call it steps, subconscious therapeutic elimination of pain signals and symptoms? And ultimately that led to stage one of a rapid journey over the past couple of years where, um, well, that's what we're going to interview him about. So please welcome to the show the man I've been referring to that you've seen on screen, Martin Rothery. Good morning, Alex. How are you doing? Um, Good morning to you. Well, my first question, quite obviously, is to say pick up from the i've given the background but this journey effectively then started with some would argue rebranding or pain to go but how can you rebrand something that wasn't the original um so you started off with uh, steps and also um pain free pendulum assisted internal uh, negotiation, fast releasing trapped energies and emotions. So can we take it from kind of there, when you, your journey starting there on your own? Yeah, I mean, basically, I was obviously training old pain to go, but I was doing it in my own 
sort of way. There were certain elements that I didn't agree with. There were certain additions that were that I was finding more beneficial. Uh, onwards from there, at the same time, I was also training what I call dreamscaping, uh, two separate mod modalities, inner journeys and interactive lucid dreaming, with the idea that even when you dream at night, your unconscious is trying to process information, um, get messages across, where if we could actually guide those with a purpose, they could um, they could be dealt with a lot quicker, almost Freudian style, but content free. Mm -hmm. uh, I was training that at the same time. At the same time, I had all the other ideas that were going on. Um, so, so I held obviously the first steps training, uh, if I remember rightly, the 7th of February, two years ago. Um, a huge amount of support with it. I think we had 60 odd people on the course. Um, and it rapidly turned into rapid pain elimination therapy. Uh, rapid pain elim elimination therapy started with, uh, obviously, steps, dreamscaping, what I call the time protocol, total integrated mind enhancement. We all love our uh, acronyms. Uh, and a process called GOSH, which was gifted to me by a very good friend and colleague in Spain, uh, which was the gift of self-healing. Uh, those four processes were working amazingly to work with almost all chronic pain but at the same time we were we were learning that all the other issues that were going on with people were related whether it was smoking other habits addictions uh weight management ptsd phobias fears so the training just naturally evolved Every time we run the training, we run it a bit different. We added something in and, and it's evolved over time, rapidly over time in, in the space of two years. We've gone from four protocols to 13 now with the release of conclusions last week. Uh, 13 protocols, lots more to come. So we've evolved from our pet, which was rapid pain elimination therapy to now sanimentology. Uh, Sanimentology is an overall name for everything we do. Um, because strictly there's not a lot of hypnosis involved in the way people term hypnosis. We Very few of our stuff, uh, our protocols use trance. There's very few inductions, um, deepeners, things like that. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to market it to the people that have this irrational fear of being hypnotized they don't want to <laughs> clock like a chicken so so obviously with with uh, hypnosis it, it steers people away and i had interest from the nhs we did nhs trials at the beginning of last year and the first thing the doctor which i'd been in um discussions with for a year previously said whatever you do don't tell anyone you're doing hypnosis because they will just not allow you to do it so, so we termed it sanimentology. Sano comes from uh, a word meaning to repair, to restore, to make whole. Mento of the mind and ology, the study research of, which is what we are continually doing. Uh, so so, it, so it's, now, it's now come into the sanimentology. Now, the other side of what we wanted to do, or my vision of what I wanted to do, was I was very much aware from my own experience that being a therapist is quite a lonely business. Many of the groups on Facebook, the support groups are, let's say, less supportive than they could be. There's a lot of bickering and that goes on within the groups and everyone stands on their own. They're self-employed and they're scratching around for clients. So I thought, why not merge the idea of a business with a team with being self-employed mm -hmm. so we formed a team and the the main selling point or the main sorry not selling point the main benefit of the RPET team which is now the sentimentology team is the fact that we are all working for the same common purpose we're all working together we're all in this as if it's one business but we're all standing on our own rights so we've got the support group which is made up of 213 people now around the world um, absolutely amazing people. 
just there's no such thing context. as a silly question. Well, again. Can I just add, just to put this in context, if people are seeing this months or years down the line, it's being recorded on the 21st of January 2020. So if it's like several years down the line from now, that you just happen to stumble across this, there's probably going to be bigger numbers than that. Yeah, stick a few <laughs> zeros on the end, by the yeah. way. <laughs> um, yes, it, the group is amazingly supportive. There's no such thing as a silly question. And the team members from day one, as they're building up their practice and their confidence, don't feel they can't ask a question and be reprimanded for it, reprimanded for it. Um, so we've got the support of that. And the other thing that had come to light that I was hearing from people going on training was they pay for the training, attend it, and then felt they were left on their own. And if there was anything they missed or they didn't quite follow, especially if it's an intense course, they became a bit stuck with it. So I thought, well, I have the facilities, I have the space, why limit the training? So when you when people sign up to become a sanimentologist now, they attend the training when they can, either via Zoom or in the room, they're both run simultaneously. Mm -hmm. But then at later dates, they can come on as many courses as they like. If they, they see the dates for tra the trainings happening, they just re-attend. And the benefits that they're getting from that is it's building their confidence. Just play devil's advocate here. Yeah. Remember, I'm being the voice of people at home watching. Some of them are immediately going to be on side, others who are sceptical, others who it doesn't really matter what we say, ain't going to change the mind, does it? They're all opinions. <laughs> Everyone's entitled to one. Why would people need to do a course again if it was taught right in the first place? There'd be some people who that would jump into their head. One of the first things to point out, and I'm sure all of the team would um, agree with me on this, because our course is evolving so rapidly, every time they come on, they learn something new. Because we, we work with the clients, we see what's really beneficial to the clients, we see where there might be a little bit of, oh, we had this client that we couldn't quite work with. So then we go back to the drawing board and why? Why didn't we work with those? let's adapt it to make it work for them as well. Mm -hmm. um, the training is very free-flowing. It's very, you've attended it yourself. Um, it's oh, very I, I, know, I know the unrelaxed. answer to a lot of the things I'll yeah. be asking you. It's just, I've, I'm asking them for the benefit of the people yeah. at home. So, yeah, it's a very relaxed training environment. And, and when people come on it, it, there's the social aspect of it as well. They're meeting other team members. Obviously, new trainees will be asking different questions to previous. But it's building that, um, what's the word? It's like, it, it's reinforcing the neural pathways. Why do you revise at school? I mean, if you've learned a lesson in school of, of algebra, for example, Ooh. why do you need to go home and revise it? Because, uh, let's be honest, if it is taught right, you don't need to. And I proved that because I never revised and I passed. No, I didn't, to be honest. But <laughs> exactly. The reason they make it to suggest you revise and to do so is to get you used to obeying authority and doing what they say and studying and repeating that which authority figures tell you to. It's indoctrination, not education. Yeah. Um, I mean, our course is quite intensive and people go away and they start working straight away with clients so that they can get their case studies in. Um, but re-attending, like I said, they do learn something new, but it just, it deepens that neuro pathway. It, it builds like almost mental muscle memory in it. Um, when you learn to drive a car, you, you drive it, but you're still conscious of gears, clutch, brakes, etc. When you've been doing it a few months or you just keep practicing it, then you forget about it and it just becomes natural. There's so re-attending the course, they're hearing new stuff. It's just deepening those pathways. One definite benefit that I've observed is that people get... Sometimes people starting out, one of their problems, um, their psychological block, shall we say, maybe, is that they know that they know what they've been taught. Yep. They don't need to revise it. It was taught right. It's all there in their head. Uh, they know that it'll work. They, they have belief that it'll work if they go and do it. But they just, some might call it the imposter syndrome. I've, I've never done it before, so 
you know, we all know whether it's stage hypnosis or therapy, it's never your first client. Yeah. But it's the fact that members of the group, when a new protocol comes out or gets adapted or whatever, I, I observe that they end up arranging, even if they live, other sides of the world, they'll end up arranging Zoom or Skype or Facebook video messaging, whatever, um, sessions to effectively rehearse, yeah. practice and do a run through with each other so they can experience it from one point of view as the client and from the other point of view, make sure they're not tripping up on words in the script outline. And I'm saying script outline because I'm... I'll get you to explain this more because yeah. there are at large elements where it's filled in by the client. That's why I'm saying it's script yeah. outline. Guidelines. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's something I've definitely noticed is, a, is an advantage and something that definitely takes place. I've seen it taking place yeah. that I haven't observed happen as much through other schools yeah. out there. Um, so if, if, if oh, by the way, for people watching, I'm not on commission here. I'm just saying, <laughs> saying it is. and believe me, you'll know I'm not on commission with some of the questions later. Um, I, but that's one of the major things that I think is USP, do we say, unique sound yeah. point and, a, and an advantage to people? The team, the team placement and the ongoing support are, are the main USPs. Apart from the protocols are bloody good. It's that ongoing community spirit. Right. The protocols are good. Don't get me wrong. And currently you said there's like 13 of them and, and growing. Somebody sat at home law might be thinking, well, hang on a minute. I've been a hypnotherapist for however many years. And yeah, I was taught numerous tools to go in my tool bag, that wanky saying. Um, but you know what? The truth is I've only ever used two or three consistently with clients in the real world and nothing else has been required just a case of adapting and tweaking them yep. contextually situationally why the need for so many different they're all they all work on the same basis i mean we're we're going into the fields um i mean we've released the addiction program free spa uh we've got the ptsd program as part of the new training etc etc and there's there's little adaptions to what's going on, say, behind the scenes, but inside the mind, if you like. And as I drill down on my theories of why this is happening to a client, we develop uh, the structure of the program to suit that. So, for example, I mean, 70% of clients most people would only need to, need to use steps. Mm -hmm. But then you've always got those clients that have a deeper need or a secondary gain. Uh, secondary gain is a big thing that sort of I've heard a lot in the hip therapy, in the hip, blah, 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 blah. put my teeth back in, mm -hmm. a lot in the hypnotherapy uh, circles as a cop-out. And I don't like cop-outs. If somebody's got a secondary gain, I want to know why that is. And at the end of the day, the secretary gain is still a program that's running that needs to be eliminated. If they've come to you with the purpose of getting better, you can't just turn and say, well, you've got too many secondary gains. Go away. I can't help you. God forbid. The say, well, why can't we make you better? Because there's yeah. something at another level stopping that happening. God forbid there's anyone watching who's already an established therapist who doesn't know what secondary gains are, but there may well be people watching who are just starting out who don't. So can you just briefly explain what secondary gains are in the... In, you know, in the um, yeah, a secondary gain is a higher intent to keep an issue than to resolve it. So, for example... Um, let's talk about pain as, as a big example, especially in this country. People might be reluctant to get rid of their pain because they get financial benefits from it. For example, disability, um, PIP, as it's called now. And not at a conscious level, because this isn't where it works, 
But at the unconscious level, the unconscious will be thinking, well, <laughs> you need that, bless you. You need that money to survive. If you remove the pain, you're not going to have that money. <laughs> And the unconscious won't be thinking, well, you can go out and work on that because it, it's analyzing what's happening right now. So we're going to keep that pain going so that you keep that money because you need it to survive. So we want to drill that. That's basically a secondary gain. Anything that gives a better reason to not get rid of the issue. So the big people who may not have known, it still does tie in, if you've read any psychology, with the idea that the unconscious or subconscious mind will always do that which it thinks is protecting you. Now, the way it manifests may not necessarily be the best thing for you, but it's based on its understanding, thinks it's doing the best thing for you. So therefore, although you want to get rid of the pain, in this example, it thinks, hang on a minute, the potential loss of uh, disability benefits, personal independent payment benefits or whatever could have a bigger knock-on effect. So it will want to protect you from what it sees as a loss or a risky situation and thus is going to make sure that the pain remains, perhaps even gets worse uh, as a wake-up call of, oh, what do you think you're doing? Yeah? That's yeah. So, so, so obviously at that level, we want to find ways to resolve the secretary gains because they've come to you. And in my opinion, you need to pull out all the stops to help them, not just fob them off with, no, you're not ready to get rid of it because of these secretary gains. Um, other sides of it is. So what, uh, how would you do that in that example? Someone who's on disability benefits comes for pain. Um, for disability, it, it's quite a simple one. And I, um, yeah. I'm going to absolve any legal responsibility here, but I would actually just turn around to the client and say, Look, at the end of the day, I'm not fraud squad. I'm not going to report you for claiming benefits and you not being in pain. It, it's a simple reframe that. Yeah. But other sexual gains would go deeper. Um, other issues, if there's deep set trauma that is unresolved, um, abuse as a child, things like PTSD, uh, stuff like that. We need to go deeper than just steps. So we'd bring in the dreamscape in um, other elements there. If there's an ongoing illness, then we'd look at the GOSH program, which is a gift of self healing, which basically puts the unconscious into a body to heal as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. The results we've had from that from team members, families and clients is amazing. Doctors are sort of seeing people coming out after an operation and they're shocked at how quick they recover from it. Um, so Gosh, the gloss, um, gift of self healing. It's like a, it's a visualization process, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's, it's a, it is a guided visualization process um, where the unconscious is prompted to visualize where it's damaged, known or unknown and start the healing process on those areas, but also to resolve things like your negative emotions, guilt, remorse, anger, which do not help the immune system. Mm -hmm. uh, arguably, roots of many illnesses stem from the emotional state of negativity, anger. We, we've shown that with our clients over the years. So I'm going to randomly throw in, I mean, you... you... Remember, I'm asking this for the benefit of people on because you yeah. already know my opinion on most of these <laughs> things. So what do you think of people like Louise Hay then? Because she was very focused on here's an issue, a health issue, and here's how it very well could have manifested through a certain emotion or event in life. I've got to admit, I've only I've only studied a very small amount of Louise Hay stuff. I'm not going to argue with any of it. Um There's two sides to it. You, there are events in your life that illnesses and pains and that can stem from. There's also states that you're in currently. At the end of the day, pain is a message. It's not a physical thing. You can't take pain out, weigh it, um, examine it. It's a message to alert you to a problem. Now, in the medical world, we focus on that problem being a physical ailment. However, I've proven even on myself, 
things like anxiety, depression, um, stress can cause pains at numerous places in the body. I've resolved many people's um, plantar fasciitis, for example, and a very, very high percentage of them suffer anxiety. They're scared to stand on their own two feet. So, so where the illness is in the body, when you think about the unconscious is trying to tell you a message, it will often use a relative part of the body to associate that. Which so if somebody's important. suffering neck problems, I will say, who is the pain in the neck? From personal experience from an ex-toxic relationship, my coccyx bone. My ex was a pain in the backside. I had to curb my language there. The people um, in America, but... Yeah, um, restless, leg, restless leg syndrome. What are you running away from? Hill spurs, pain in the hills. Stop digging your hills in and move forward with your life. And these all relate, and I, I'm sure Louise Hay touches on those sort of things. She does, yeah. 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 As I said, I don't know a lot about her. I've not studied a lot of her stuff, so not well, enough. It's, it's very much in line with, yeah. well, with, with, with what you do. That's why I brought it yeah. up. I'm sure there'll be some people watching going, oh, this sounds quite in line with um, you can heal your life, Louise Hay. And yeah, um, it no, no doubt it is. But then we look at the bigger picture on, why these messages are there and what they need to resolve them. And this is where the additional stuff comes in. Um, I was, the release that we've just done, Conclusions, I was doing a lot of research and study on the amygdala and its how it processes. And I came up, well, it's obviously an idea that's been floated and used before. But it was my point of focus that any major issues such as fears, phobias, PTSD, being stuck in life, depression, anxiety, had to be led by stuff being unfinished in the amygdala. For the same reason you get a song stuck in your head, if you don't, uh, if you listen to a whole song, it generally won't get stuck in your head. But if you only listen to half of a song, it becomes stuck in your head because the unconscious hates unfinished business. This is how nested loops and uh, in stories work, why people get hooked on series is on TV, because the unconscious keeps it in the um, analyzing part of the brain until it's resolved. And this is the same with events throughout your life. If it's resolved and concluded, then it will either go to um, the hypothalamus to be processed and fight, flight, make a decision or it will go into the hippocampus, into the memories, where it's safely locked away. But if it's unresolved, it sits in the amygdala, which physically changes size. When it changes size and becomes bigger with the more information it stores, it perceives more danger. It becomes more active. So Conclusions was about allowing the unconscious to go through your entire life creating a positive conclusion to anything that was not concluded. We all know the unconscious has no concept of fantasy or reality. Yeah. So when it creates its own conclusion, it's then safe to release that into the memory, which allows it to be free from the amygdala. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes total so, sense. So we wrote that, um, and it was really quite a big step up an extension from the dreamscaping but it's some of the more complicated stuff we do could be used to resolve simple pains but it's like you wouldn't bring in a bulldozer to knock down a two brick high wall no so it's it's more and more complicated stuff to deal with more and more and more complicated issues because I'm one of these therapists that don't want to keep clients around for session after session after session. If I can do it in five, 10 minutes, I want to do it in five, 10 minutes. That client's got a life. I've got a life. I'd rather I'm in, out the door, resolved. But then if the issue is bigger and they need two, three, four sessions, then we have the tools to keep throwing to resolve the different elements. So conclusions will do the unfinished business. We also have the Schrodinger, which will... Um, the other job of the amygdala is to tie emotion to a memory. So, for example, hearing your favorite song from a holiday brings back good feelings. Yeah. It goes negative as well. So there's certain events 
for example, within PTSD, uh, a soldier hearing gunshot will have an emotion of fear tied to that gunshot. Now, when they hear a firework, it's the same sort of sound and it triggers that thing. So we wrote Schrodinger as a way to change the emotional state that was linked to past events, even the tiny ones. Rather than picking on one particular event, because there could be lots that are built up, we go through their entire existence and all events that have had negative emotions tied to can have those emotions either tamed down, if they are still essential, or change so that they don't cause future issues like PTSD, fears, phobias, etc. So each protocol has a different purpose. People are not always consciously aware of what those things are that, um, in, in terms of conclusions, weren't properly finished, or in terms of this, may have been trigger points that associations are made to. Yeah. Uh, so I assume, for the benefit of people at home, that things are structured and worded in a manner to gear the person an unconscious, subconscious, call it what you will, level to, as I think it was Milton Erickson, or maybe, well, he did say, but I think Sigmund Freud did as well, said that the, in, the unconscious is capable of finding answers to everything itself. It just needs direction and instruction in what to be searching for in the first place. Yes, uh, and that's been my philosophy in the entire development of what uh, Sanimentology stands for. Um, all of the, or most of the protocols are completely content free with a clear instruction of this is what's expected of the unconscious mind. Uh, we also have the intent of the client and the therapist to resolve that. So we don't generally do things like pre-talks or anything, but what we do say to the client is have a clear intent on what you want the outcome to be. Because you're consciously then going to stimulate the unconscious to resolve the issues that are behind it, which are very seldom what they think they are. Mm -hmm. And this is why content free is so powerful. Uh, the unconscious mind will then create wild and wacky scenarios, its own analogies, if you like, and metaphors to resolve the issues that need resolving. Well, yeah, talking of wild and wacky mental images, um, and man, I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about the lucid dreaming stuff. Uh, because um, I'll just say for viewers at home, if it sounds a bit wacky, bear in mind that when you go to sleep at night, and rest assured you all dream, just not everyone necessarily remembers when they wake up, but the people that do remember, a lot of people will tell you they have the most bizarre dreams, and it... it, it, it the weight of evidence suggests that this is the unconscious mind taking bits from everyday life uh, and past that might relate to it or future dreams, aspirations, putting it together and manifesting it and trying to work it through. And it, that, and it goes off and on. It becomes abstract and weird, but it is ultimately acting in your best interest to try and assimilate all these bits of information that have gone in. Now, I know you've got a kind of lucid dreaming. Thing. Yeah, I mean, the conclusions use that as well. The interesting thing is the most active part of the brain when you're dreaming, when you're asleep at night, is the amygdala. Now, the amygdala, the amygdala is only responding to unfinished stuff. Right. Hence why we focused on it so much. So with, with the interactive lucid dreaming, we, we basically... Uh, send somebody into dream state very, very rapidly. And their imagination will create scenarios to resolve any issues that are going on. And as, as a therapist, we go with them. They are feeding back, telling us what's going on, and we're guiding them along the way without interfering with the journey. But we're just keeping them safe, guiding them along. And what's the word? Um just prompting the unconscious to move on to I'm the next part. Dream state, just for the, again, for the benefit of people at home, I always remember it as bat, bat dung, as in dung shit, bat dung, B-A-T-D, beta, alpha, theta, delta, because that's the order, that's how I remember yes. it. Now, beta is 
wide awake the, uh, the, the, as we are now. Alpha generally is daydreamy type state. Theta is stereotypically equated to what people talk about hypnosis being. And delta is at night type to sleep dreaming. What would you kind of relate it to? Um, it's a difficult one to answer that one because, so excuse me there, my landlord's just waved at me. <laughs> <story>. <laughs> um, it's a difficult one to answer that one because they are fully alert. They are fully, they just sat there or stood there fully alert. They're not snoring, but their dream, their interactive lucid dream when they're in it is that real to them that they can't tell the difference between that and what's really going on to the level that I've got people in the team that when I've done the training with them and taken them into their dream state, uh, I remember one person was um, on a boat and she got off the boat and stepped onto an iceberg. Mm -hmm. And the minute she stepped onto the iceberg, her glasses steamed up physically. So obviously the unconscious is responding as if it's reality. You see, I would that argue it's probably, in, I don't know. I would argue it's probably AD, as in a combination of starts off as daydreaming in the normal sense, but with the eyes closed as visualization. Yeah. But because of the fixation of attention and guided visualization, you bypass the critical faculty ultimately and arguably get so called hypnosis, which is the, uh, sorry, AT even, I should say. Uh, into theta, so it becomes a combination of alpha daydreaming and theta hypnosis at the same time. Yeah, yeah, quite possibly. And to them, it is real. And when they when they've come back, both clients and trainees. Obviously, trainees, I'll ask the questions. I I don't want to pick at the clients too much because I want their the processes to be more uh, effective. Yeah. But when I question the trainees, they they will agree that to them at that moment, it was real. They weren't sat in my training room or in a chair. They were experiencing exactly what they were seeing in their dream. Rather like when you're dreaming at night. Mm. And we've had clients that have broken down in tears, uh, trainees that have broken down in tears because they've met a loved one that died and had a conversation with them to resolve anything that was left unsaid. So we've had tears of joy We've had people feel some physical pain from going through an accident that might be unresolved from the past. Um, like I said, the glass is steaming up, so actual physiological changes to the body in response to what it's imagining. Uh, people go hot, they go cold. They respond to the environment that they are imagining, mm. if you like. Excellent. So I'm going to drag you back briefly because you mentioned it before, but then didn't kind of you just mentioned it. Didn't yeah, uh, this is what I do. Escaping. So that's the interactive lucid dreaming is one part of it, and that's the guided one, which is obviously a one on one. The other part of dreamscaping is the inner journey, which starts as a guided visualization to place them in a position that they can then have the freedom to work on whatever their unconscious mind chooses they need to work on. Now, this is why we set the intent at the beginning. We want you to do this. Then the unconscious mind will resolve the root issue, not what we think is the cause, but the root issue in a way that they're safe, they're secure, and they'll have experiences. The general way we do it sort of with the inner journey is we set them in a building with lots of rooms and they can choose the room or the unconscious mind will choose the room that they go to. Now, under basic um, psychology, and, and one of the studies is cockology, we have a universal set of symbols that fit different rooms, for example. So a kitchen would usually be social. Uh, a bathroom would be health and cleanliness. A basement would be fears and phobias. Mm -hmm. uh, bedroom, your intimate relationships. So they will go to a corresponding room to whatever their issue is at the time. 
and they will have an experience that their mind chooses to resolve what's going on. It's yeah. almost like a way to allow them to receive the message that the unconscious mind is trying to be, has been trying to give them, which is what the issue is. Mm -hmm. They're not listening to what the unconscious mind's not getting the message through. I can't remember the name of the author off the top of my head, but it was Mar Martin put me onto them. The book's called Cockology, and that's with a K. Yeah, K O K. Yeah. Ology. Otherwise, and yeah, otherwise you might get things you don't want to see <laughs> on, on on the search. But they're well worth getting. Well worth having a read up. They're like mental. They're almost like logic puzzles. Some of them, but. In the context of what Martin just said, when you read them and bear in mind what he just said, you'll see how a lot of them could be used as metaphors for healing psychologically in therapeutic circumstances. Um, so we're going to go right back to the beginning briefly, if, we, if, if you don't mind, Martin, back to what has morphed into rapid pain elimination therapy. Because some of the stuff that you've just been talking about, actually, I know it's more comes under the mind mediation. Yeah, we, we had a lot of and, terms. We had the mind mediation, which is just um, acting as a mediator between the two parts of the mind. Um, if I... If you don't mind me giving a bit of an analogy on Go why, for it. why I think it's so effective. And there's other therapies that use the same process. Mm -hmm. Anyone that's trained to be a hypnotherapist will usually have come across the idea of the critical faculty being the guard at the gate. And you need to get through the gate into the castle that is your unconscious mind. Mm -hmm. That critical faculty or the guard is there to protect the programming in the unconscious. So that if I said to a random person climb to the top of the building jump you can fly the critical faculty is there saying hold on a minute no that's rubbish we're not allowing that to go into the programming yeah so our job as a therapist is to get past that critical faculty now there's numerous ways to do it and and how i explain it in the training when you think of it as being a guard you could use a rapid or an instant induction like they use on stage or quite a few therapies use now, in my analogy of this, that's like punching the guard on the chin and knocking him out. And you go in. You could use a long drawn out um, PMR, progressive muscle relaxation. Imagine a white light coming down, all this, all that stuff. You're boring the guard to death. He basically says, I've had enough of this, I'm going to sleep. And you're in. You could use an authoritarian approach and people use that inadvertently. Uh, doctors, teachers, abusive partners, parents. They have the authoritarian approach, which bypasses critical faculty. That's like the guard's boss coming down, the general, and saying, let them through. Yeah. The way I like to describe what we do is we, we, um, we use this thing that's very seldom taught nowadays, manners. We go up to the guard and say, will you let us in? We're here to help. And the guard says yes, using an idiomotor response, an involuntary motion of the body. The what guard if says, says yes. No? What, if, what if it says no because he it thinks it's protecting? Then, then we give a bit of persuasion. We say, look, we are here to help in the same way as you are. Let us in. And we just keep going until we've got that. I've never had anyone that's not let me in. And I don't think any of our clients, uh, our trainees have. The unconscious knows if you're there maliciously or not and that's part of your sort of being there with good intent yeah um now because you've got permission to be there and that's the only way you have permission all of the others your rapids your pmrs your authoritarian you don't have permission to be there you've snuck in and i think that's why a lot of the process you use sneaky language metaphors analogies stories but because we've got the permission to be there we can just talk clean, pure language in the way of you have this going on. It's not helping them. I understand you created it for good purposes in the beginning, but it's no longer relevant. Will you please delete it? And we've shown time and time again, even some of the deepest phobias. Two, three minutes, they're gone. Just clearly by asking. For it to right, be OK, give us a 
without yeah. giving too much away, because obviously I know... Yeah, I'm trying to be careful tip. how much I say here. But by the same token, we'll just... I'll, I'll keep it to this then. Keeping it to the kind of example which is, as we've already said, published in Frogs into Princes and Tad James, Hypnosis, yep. a Comprehensive Guide, one of the Rogue Hypnotist books. And for the record, I am... Not going to tell you whether I'm the rogue hypnotist or not, <laughs> despite the fact everyone on the internet, well, not everyone, but a lot of people think I am. Uh, but anyway, no, um, in the context of what was laid out as the, it was known as the six step reframe. Yeah. Uh, there were slight tweaks to it by different people long before any of the stuff we talked about before occurred. And my overview sentence before you explain it, but give an example is that yes, it is, and I've, don't forget, viewers at home, I've done all the courses that Martin does, all the ones since. I know I did. The, I said I did the old pain to go, but I've done all the others since as well. It's that by being nice, using manners, you get permission to get into the unconscious, subconscious, whatever you wish to call it. If you like, you gain access into the uh, user admit administrator area of the personal laptop computer but with permission and you then are able to go in there and as you would in a computer tap in delete file that's causing problem with whatever and then it's gone you can say look can you find all thoughts memories emotions feelings triggers anchors associations whatever connected to that which was causing you to have a fear of spiders, for example, and uh, just delete those as rapidly as you feel is appropriate for you, and then let us know with your nod of your head, your move of your finger, whatever. Yep. And when they've done that, Martin's seen it happen, his students have, I've seen it happen. Once they confirm... And they're confirming through an idiomotor response, so from an unconscious level, that they've done what was required to delete all those memories, thoughts, associations, feelings, anchors, triggers, whatever. So it can no longer bother them, worry them, concern them as it once did in the past. Then, if it was a spider phobia, you can get the spider and they'll, they'll hold it uh, and probably laugh at how ridiculously they easy very it often was. Feel very silly. So, I mean, how would you explain it? That's my, uh, I'm going to say layman's, my for people. Well, if, you, if you think about it, every, every time there's a choice, a response, uh, an action, an event in somebody's life, the unconscious will tie a trigger to it, a, a reaction or a response. That's the job of the amygdala. And if there's a danger sense to it, then that will start that whole process of creating the phobia. Now, it doesn't have to be... Um, for example, spiders, I mean, one of the silliest, because very often they're never in any danger from the spider. It's yeah. a learnt behaviour from their peers, their parents, their siblings. But the unconscious is, oh, they're scared. Maybe I should be too. It's almost like crowd mentality. Um, but other things, you could have somebody with a fear of flying. And it would have been nothing to do with aeroplanes. It might have been... When they were very young, they were in the room when their mum and dad were having a blazing row, and there just happened to be a magazine on the table with an aeroplane on the cover. And the unconscious has picked up that as a stimuli, associated with the fear of the loud noise of the shouting, and tied it in together. And it starts off as a seed, but then over the years, things build up and layer and layer. I remember... Um, one of the stories I tell in training, I had a, I nearly got a parking ticket and I used this to get out of it in a nice way. Um, I was parked somewhere for too long and traffic warden came at, like, was just putting a ticket on the car as I got to the car. And he saw the sign in the back of my car saying I was a therapist. Now this um, parking guy had a fear of heights to the point he couldn't walk across the footbridge that went across the main road. Yeah. Uh, my first thought was, right, I know where to park in future. <laughs> and I thought, well, I, I got talking to him. And I had a very, very quick um, session in the middle of the car park next to my car. Um, we had a chat first. It turns out he had this fear of heights now. He was in his 50s. When he was 30, he'd climbed the Empire State Building. 
no problem whatsoever. Ah. And he couldn't understand why he had the fear now. So first thing I said to him was like, when you, when you climbed the Empire State Building, how did it feel? And he said, well, it was exhilarating. It was exciting. Like, how do you feel now if you go high up? And he analyzed it. He's like, do you know, it's the same feeling, but it's just too overwhelming that I can't cope with it. So I'm like, so arguably you had a bit of a fear when you climbed the Empire State Building. Yeah. So I did something I don't do anymore. I did a very, very quick regression. This was, this was before I sort of did my mediation and steps and stuff. I did a very quick regression in the middle of the car park. I know that's not entirely legal and safe and secure, but I made sure it was all right. And it turns it's, out... It is legal. There's no yeah. laws against it. Or could it be argued about being performance? Yeah, but it's for therapy. Yeah. It's for therapy. Um, and it turns out, when he was uh, four years old... He was climbing the stairs behind his brother and he made his brother cry. And he was halfway up the stairs and his dad came out and walloped him one. Ah. Now, halfway up the stairs to a four-year-old is quite a high place. Yeah. And he associated that height with the pain of being waxed by his dad. And that was the seed. So then every time he was high up after, he had that little bit of fear which put another layer on which built up and built up and built up. And arguably, maybe the Empire State Building as being the really high place, put the final layer, which created the fear. So basically, we just resolved that. We, we just said, right, adult you, talk to little you and tell little you that it's not to do with the height, it's because you're a little bugger. <laughs> and it came back, and I actually walked across the footbridge with him, and he looked down, and he, he actually looked over the edge, and he's like... Do you know, I feel so daft. And I said, well, that session would normally cost you £150. What are you going to do for me? They just took a ticket. It's like, there we go. Nice one. But that, that pointed out that it started as a childhood thing. There was a tiny little seed. And then it laid up over the years until it had become this full-blown phobia. Mm -hmm. Now, if I dealt with, say, what he thought was the issue, say, climbing the Empire State Building, it would have left all the other stuff before, which would give light to the idea that maybe in six months' time, that phobia is going to come back. But because I removed the seed right at the beginning, there's nothing else for it to build on in the future. But now, obviously, I mean, you could do that with a regression. But rather than making people live through that event again, we do it with my mediation and steps and the other process we do to create a different sort of analogy. And it does it in a way that keeps it safe. So, for example, I, um, I've dealt with some quite serious PTSD sufferers. And they've had to do it on multiple levels and usually using the dreamscaping, they've gone back to the original event. But when an event's too traumatic, the unconscious will keep, a, keep them safe by creating a safe analogy. So, for example, he did have to go back to one of the wars that he was in. Mm -hmm. But rather than the unconscious creating a memory of it, it created a metaphor of it where he was in a snowball fight with his friends. Okay. Uh -huh. <coughs> Sorry, excuse, excuse me. So a snowball fight was safe, but there's still the conflict. So he was able to resolve the conflict without have, having to relive the traumatic memory. He came out of that and it just blew him away. It was like, that was so easy. So, so that's the purpose of Excellent. like keeping it content free. First of all, the unconscious will deal with the root rather than what the client thinks or you thinks the root, which is often unexpected. But it will, it will also deal with it in a way that the client doesn't have to relive shit. Oh, might have to believe that bit. No, you're all right. Don't that's right. Awesome. Then. Um, it's a far worse on some previous editions. Yeah, of that's right, then. Like, and, and the other side of thinking with the content free is very often what we think is the issue might not be the issue. Mm -hmm. um, I found it myself. I've had people that had an aversion to fruit and veg. It actually turned out they had a choking phobia when, mm -hmm. I, when I actually went in content free. Uh, people who've had a certain... Um, Let's go on addictions. Many of the therapies deal with removing the addiction, but an addiction isn't the issue. 
what's the issue is the driver that drives the addiction. And if you don't resolve the driver, then the addiction will be replaced with another one. You can remove the addiction, yeah. You can make alcohol taste like absolute crap. But then they might start gambling or something else because yeah. they still have the driver behind it. Whereas doing it content-free with the processes we use, we remove the driver behind it to prevent any other addiction needing to take its place. And we don't need to know what it is because the unconscious mind, as you said previously, knows all the solutions. It just needs that kick up the bomb to find them. Cool. Now, I've got a couple more questions because sadly time's running away with us. But before I do, for, for viewers of this program, you'll know that despite me having this perceived reputation on the internet uh, as someone who takes every opportunity to advertise his own stuff, on past episodes of this, I haven't done that at all. Um, which will probably, by the time this episode is out, people will probably be going, has he lost the plot or something? Because this is completely not what we thought would occur. Now, I I'm going to tell you right here, right now, that will continue with the vast majority of other interviews that come after that. But you'll see why I'm breaking my self-imposed rule for this one, <laughs> for this one episode uh, because it'll be beneficial to some viewers of this. I've not even discussed this with Martin, so he's about to punch me through the screen, potentially. <laughs> he can always say no. Um, if you are watching this and you are already, and um, th this will make sense in a minute, if you are already a provable existing member of my Elite Hypnosis Bootcamp, and Martin will check, he will send me a message, so it's pointless contacting him saying you're a member and hoping that he, he doesn't check. He will check with me if you are. But if you are provably an existing member, then contact Martin for more details about his courses and stuff. But if you can prove that you're already an existing boot camp member, I am sure Martin will give you some kind of discount because you're already a boot camp member. And the logic behind that is because Martin very kindly in the past has recommended my boot camp to his students and his team. Uh, and the vast majority of them are members of the, of the boot camp now. And in the same way, if you are one of Martin's team who's not yet in the boot camp or you become a member of the team in future, contact me and let me know that you're in Martin's team. I will chat with him, obviously. And then I will let you into the boot camp at a massively, drastically reduced, ridiculously low rate. So it works in both directions. That's the only reason I brought my self-imposed uh, advert ban, because it's a benefit to viewers. Yeah. Okay, shall we talk current figures on that then? And I'll make the offer right now off the top of my head. Which is the 20... We're recording this on the 21st of January... 2020 i make that clear because if you're seeing it two years down the line these figures will give you an example yep. but obviously may not be completely relevant so in terms of the elite hypnosis boot camp it sells as much as four thousand nine hundred ninety seven dollars it quite often if you're lucky enough to find the right site can be got for about a thousand dollars but if you are a one of martin's team and you can prove such then I, if you contact me, only for members of Martin's team, I will let you into the boot camp for a single one-off payment of, uh, as we stand in January 2020, uh, £227 United Kingdom sterling with nothing else to ever pay. Okay, from my side, um, the training is 23 days. You And you can do it again as many times as you want. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you sign up for a lifetime membership, so the payment is a one-off. There's no annual fees or any other charges to you. The training can be done live, in person at the centre. You can attend via Zoom. It's broadcast at the same time. Uh, and I have people on the big screen, so it's like you're in the room with me. And there's also video recordings of the training to sit through at your own pace. And then you can come back with the questions. Well, can I just Obviously, say you join the group for support. Can I just say, when Martin says it's like you're in the room, it really is with Zoom, because when he asks people who are live in the room if they've got any questions, you'll also be able to interact and ask questions as yeah, well. Absolutely. Um, 
obviously you get the support, the ongoing um, membership of, of the group. The current price for all of that is £5,999. If you're a member of the boot camp, then you can have it at the current early bird of £1,999. So that's quite a that's saving. Nice. Yeah. And another benefit that Martin hasn't said, and I would argue that this is probably one of the, the biggest benefits, and the, the reason I'd argue it's one of the biggest benefits is because in truth, as Martin's already said, in, uh, uh, and he's very open about it, the underlying core essence of these protocols is nothing new. However, they have been tweaked and elaborated and road tested and stuff. But what, because I mean, in my boot camp, I have a thing called Cured, which effectively is a communication with the unconscious mind, six step reframe thing. What the real bad, one of the real benefits is the team, the support, um, and the branding. Don't underestimate the power of nice logos, catchy names because they capture the imagination of potential clients and because they're in different niches um so obviously you've got for pain you've got rapid pain elimination therapy or steps and the logo is like a, um, a pathway to a brighter uh, pain-free future it th these stimulate the potential clients unconscious subconscious minds their brain triggers their find the solution to their problem tree and that will help you get business. Those things are, are, are really powerful, I believe. Yeah, absolutely. So we have got, we, we've just hit the one hour. Um, so that tells me I have to ask you the last question, I'm afraid, um, which is the question I've asked every single person and we'll be doing through all the rest of the interviews and that is other than the obvious and we've already done the plug for the courses your website address will be below this video so you can click directly on that link people watching this video when it goes live on hypnosis week although you verbally please do give out the websites at the end um somebody comes and knocks on your door this is a hypothetical situation and they say you know what I've read a couple of books I'm really interested. I want to get into the world of mind therapy. What would your top three tips, insights, pearls of wisdom, call them what you will, be to help that person avoid wasting money, avoid wasting time, avoid pitfalls and failures to make their path smoother for them? Is this in terms of training or going forward as a business? Both, a bit of both, what, you know. Um, the first, oh, you've hit me with that one, actually, because uh, it would be more of a discussion than anything else. Uh, and obviously, I'll be trying to sell my stuff. Um, find a reputable trainer with a track record mm -hmm. and speak to the people who've trained with that trainer. Completely agreed um have the pure intent and confidence which will come in time and go into it for the right reasons um don't chase the money don't think oh i know this therapist that's charging 250 pound an hour i'd like a bit of that if you chase the money it's all you're always going to be chasing the money it'll be elusive chase the passion have a passion for doing the job the money will always follow Excellent. You know, so it's like I'm playing um, Hypnosis Week interview lottery. Now, by the time this goes out, could we start on the 26th of, uh, sorry, 25th of January? And there's an interview a day for nine days. That's launch week of the two weekends. And then it'll be weekly episodes thereafter. And I want to see how many of them, you just said it at position number three. The last couple I recorded also said it at position number three in the answers. Some other people said it position two or position one. But the point is they said it. Yeah. The majority of people have said it's got to be your passion, yeah. not to be just about yeah. the money. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I never look at the money side of it. If I see a client, I'll even see them for free if I think they're worthy of it. I mean, obviously, if they're just trying to con me to get free therapy. But it's it's chasing that passion. 
and helping people. And that, if you do it going for the money, I, I think it's even going to interrupt the therapy because if you have the intent that you want money from it, then at a sub-communication level, their unconscious mind is going to know that. And you're not going to get in as easily to do the work. You're not going to build that rapport that comes naturally from yeah. just having this pure intent of, oh, you've come here. I want to help you. That will get you in. Whereas if, ah, money, that's going to shut you out. So it is chase the passion. And you do that. You can't go wrong. Excellent. Excellent advice. Thank you so much, Martin, for your time. No, thank you. Uh, can you. Please, it will be below the video, but can you verbally please tell everybody how they can find you? Uh, they can find me on Facebook as Martin Rothery. Um, the Facebook group at the moment is Become a Rapid Pain Elimination Therapist. That group will always exist. From there, you can find other information. Uh, or the website, which is a little bit out of date at the moment, is rapidpainelimination.therapy.com As I said, there will be links below this video as well. Uh, thank you so much, Martin. It's been a pleasure. Thank That's you all good. for watching, as I say, every week. Now you've watched it, I'll... Some of you cheeky buggers, I bet, have already got a pad and pen and been taking notes. But as I always say, if you haven't, get a pad and pen, watch this again and take notes because there's a lot of wisdom, a lot of insights and a lot of things uh, in the past hour that Martin has shared. So thanks again, Martin. Thank you, viewers at home. See you next week for another edition of Hypnosis Week. <laughs>